Hey everybody, my name's Matt. I am the West Campus Pastor, and I hope you guys are having a great weekend. Sorry I can't be with you in person. Well, I, I guess none of us are really in person right now, but uh, it is a soccer weekend for my family this weekend, and we have, uh, because of the rain, got a game rescheduled for Sunday afternoon, so Ryan asked me if I could record this, and um, I think I've got this going right so that we can we can still share and um, and talk about love as we begin our re-engage uh, lessons. And uh, this gives me a good way to be with you guys, even though I can't be with you online. So thanks for your grace. Thanks to Ryan uh, for letting me record this instead of being here in, in live person, I guess. But I uh, hope you guys are having a great weekend and I hope you guys are enjoying the re-engage experience. It's a fantastic ministry. It's gonna be great for your marriage no matter where you are and no matter why you guys have signed up. It's one that I recommend so strongly to all of our couples at the West Campus, and I'm glad that you guys are involved, and I hope it's a blessing to you and to your marriage. Now, Ryan has asked me to talk about the topic of love, and love is one of those topics that we all kind of know what it is, but uh, our, um, let's call it application of what we know, isn't always as good as we would like for it to be or as consistent. We all kind of tend to think of ourselves as pretty good lovers in the sense of, I know how to love someone. Uh, but when, it, when the rubber meets the road, how consistent are we in love? Or when I say I love you to someone, do I mean the same thing that they mean when they say it to me? Are our definitions of love on the same page? And while many of us think that we're pretty good at loving, I think we would all probably also readily admit that we're pretty inconsistent in our ability to love others well. So that's kind of the one thing we have in common, no matter where you are in your marriage relationship right now in this re-engage process, that's the one thing we all have in common. We know what love is, we know we should love, but we're not as good at loving as we know we ought to be. And that's hard. And that certainly gives us um, reason for growth and reason to apply what Jesus has taught us about love, uh, especially in this context. We, um, we also have a hard time with love because we have different definitions, different expectations. And a lot of times in love, we're trying to get love for ourselves rather than being focused on giving love towards others. So what I want to do today is walk you through a basic definition of what love is. Hopefully that would be one that you can both use and apply and get you on the same page about what we mean when we say I love you to one another. And then secondly, I'm hoping that through this lesson, I can inspire you to give love to your spouse the way that Jesus has given love to you that we wouldn't be wrapped up in saying, well, I don't, I don't feel as loved as I love you. That we're not wrapped up in getting love as much as we are focused on giving love, regardless of the behavior of the other person. So that's my goal today. It's gonna to be short and sweet and to the point. I wanna walk you through a few texts. And as I do that, I wanna kind of fill in a definition as we go that I think will help you as you uh, seek to apply the concept of love in your marriages. So um, let's get started. We all know that the Bible essentially says that love is the hallmark of Christianity, okay? It's our calling card. Jesus said to his disciples, people will know that you are my followers by the way that you love one another. And the purpose of marriage is to illustrate the relationship that God has with us as his people, the way that he cares for us should influence the way we care for each other. And so our relationship as husband and wife really ought to image God's relationship with us to the rest of the world. It's how God wants to demonstrate love to the world now that Jesus is in heaven and we are here as his representatives on the earth. So since love is so important to Christianity, it's so important to knowing who God is, it's important that we not have any discrepancies on what that is in our own marriages. It's important that we be on the same page and unified 
in that regard. So the first biblical passage that is important for us to know and understand when it comes to a basic definition of love is 1 John 3.16, and it says this, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, talking about Jesus, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. At its most basic, love is laying down your life for someone else's benefit. I really like the term laying down because so many times in life we walk into a situation, we have hopes and dreams and expectations of what we would like to do in any given moment. But we see that someone else might have different hopes and dreams and expectations. And all of a sudden, those two things are opposed to one another. And we are faced with a choice. Are we going to, to try to get what we want for what we need? Or are we going to look at the other person and go, I'm going to lay down what I want and hope for so that the other person can be blessed and cared for through my laying down of what I want. That's what we're talking about here when we're talking about the laying down of our lives for someone else. It's essentially the way that we bless someone instead of trying to seek blessing for ourselves. It's giving rather than trying to get. The posture of love is always focused on giving to someone else rather, rather than trying to get for oneself. So 1 John 3.16 the first component of our definition has to include the idea of laying down our life. The second component in our definition for love comes from Romans 5, verse 8, and it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ laid down his life. For us. And the important thing here that we need to see is that the laying down of my life, the sacrifice that I make when I'm choosing to love someone, is not based on the performance of the other person. It's not because they have done life so well or made me feel good or done anything that is worthy of praise. In fact, the Bible teaches us it's quite the opposite, that even when they're acting like an enemy, even when they've betrayed me, even when they've done me harm, I have an example in Jesus of how I can lay down my life for a sinner who doesn't deserve it and bless them and give to them rather than trying to take and get from them for myself. We don't want love to be currency where we kind of back and pay each other back and forth for good performance with acts of love. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine, because that's not what love is. That's not how God operates with us um, in our relationship with him. God loves us because of a promise that he made to us, not how well we perform. And that's what you all have done. When you took your wedding vows, when you stood before God, before a minister, before your friends, there were no ifs in your wedding vows. There was no time when you said, I will love you as long as you do the dishes, or I will love you as long as you don't put on 400 pounds. There are no ifs in the wedding vows that we made, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish until death do us part. These are things I promise to give you regardless of how you treat me, regardless of whether, you're, whether or not you do the dishes or anything like that. That our promise to love, that love itself is not based on the performance of the other person because the other person that we're loving is a sinner. And that sinner is in need of love. In fact, when we love someone based on their performance, it's just a really kind of fancy, sly way for us to get something from them. We're not really giving anything to them. Another, pa another passage that illustrates this point really well is 1 Peter 4.8. 
and it says, love covers a multitude of sins. It's always interesting to me that when we come and experience the failure of another person, when our, when our wife disappoints us, or when our husband doesn't do what we expected him to do, how do we handle that failure? How do we handle that missed expectation? Well, we typically have two coverings for it. Either we can cover that failure in our wrath, or we can cover that failure in the love that we know we have received from Jesus for our own failures. Love is a better covering for failure than wrath. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say that love is designed for failure. It, is, it shines the brightest when it is given in light and in full awareness of failure, missed expectation, and shortcoming. So love covers a multitude of sins because that's what Jesus' love did for us. He didn't treat us as our sins deserved. Instead, he laid down his life and blessed us. He gave us a blessing, even though we were still his enemies. So the third part is when you look at how Jesus laid down his life for us, and that is most clearly illustrated in Philippians chapter 2, really the first eight verses, but in particular in verses 5 through 8 and verses 3 and 4. How does Jesus lay down his life for us? Well, it says that he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Position isn't something that was important to him in his, um, in his laying down his life for us. He was glad to give up his position, his rights, his power, his authority, anything so that we could have a blessing. It says that he emptied himself. He gave away what was most important and dear to him, and that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There was no limit to the generosity of Jesus when it came to his giving of love towards us. You know, the Psalms say that the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. And I know a lot of times my love endures until like maybe the first disappointment or the second missed expectation or something like that. But when I, when I remember that God's love and the, the love of who God is in total never fails, that it endures forever, it reminds me of this passage in Philippians 2 where there is no limit. There is no um, um, regulation on how much love you can give to someone. If you want to give your entire life, that's what makes love beautiful. And the second part is in uh, verses three and four, where he says about um, the application of this is that we should regard others as more important than ourselves. When we take the attitude of Jesus and we see the way he laid down his life for us, we should regard other people as more important than ourselves. You know, we tend, if we don't think highly of someone, we don't tend to treat them well. We tend to be short with them. We try to get from them rather than give. And we usually grade them on their performance. And we're not generous with them when it comes to love. And as much as we'd hate to admit it, a lot of times that happens with the people that we're the closest with. But the Bible teaches us differently. The Bible teaches us that we are to regard other people as more important than ourselves. That when it comes to what I want versus what my spouse wants, I should be thinking about what her wants are before I ever think of my own. And that's the way that we uh, can continue to lay down our lives for one another. So this brings us now, you know, so we got these kind of four ingredients here for our definition that I would submit to you is one that you would uh, use to help you remember what you mean when you say, I love you to one another. So here's the definition that, that I've come up with. It's helped me in my marriage that I hope helps you guys as well. Love is this. Love is the laying down of your life. We talked about that laying down 
for the benefit because love is always what I'm laying down and what I'm giving to the other person is always go out to bless them. It doesn't bless me, it blesses them. So the laying down of my life for the benefit of a sinner, someone who is not perfect, somebody who has missed my expectations, who has failed, and that sinner is more important than me. Love is laying down your life for the benefit of a sinner who is more important than you. This is how Jesus has loved us, and that's the love that we ought to share with each other as his followers, and especially as husband and wife. If the, if the marriage relationship is supposed to illustrate the relationship that God has with humanity, then all the more reason that we need to be about the business of loving one another the way Jesus has loved us. So a couple of um, applications for what this might look like. Um, uh, I'll just give you a basic example. There's going to be a time in the near future when you're going to have a rough day at work or you're going to have a rough day at home. And when the day ends and you come home from work or when your spouse comes home from work and you've had a rough day at home, you're going to want to do something that helps you helps you unwind, that helps you relax, that gets the problem away from you, that helps you not think about it. And so you don't want to be around the kids or you don't want to cook dinner or all you want to do is prop your feet up and, and have a drink and watch, watch the evening news or watch your show on Netflix or whatever it is. And it's in those moments when we are tired or not feeling well or when we had a hard day or when our boss is breathing down our neck or when stress is high that's when we're super focused on ourselves, what I need, what I want, what I deserve. And those are moments when we need to remember what the Bible teaches us about love, that those are moments when we can lay down our lives instead of thinking about what I want, what I need, what I deserve. I should be thinking as I walk into the house after having a rough day at work, what does my wife need? What does my wife deserve? What does my wife want? And I'm telling you guys, as you focus on blessing someone else to the detriment of what you need, love finds itself to be reciprocal. If you were to walk into your house, plop down on the couch and serve yourself instead of thinking about your wife, I'm telling you, that's not going to create intimacy in your marriage. That's not going to create oneness in your marriage. That's not going to do anything to help you guys love one another better. But if you've had a hard day and you come down and you lay down your life uh, for your wife and you walk in and you take the kids away and get them out of her hair, or you walk in and you cook dinner and tell her to go take a bath or something or you know, relax, those are things that make her feel special loved, understood, known, cared for, that that now inspires her and gives her reason to go, how can I think about what he needs and what would bless him? And she does it in return. So that's the amazing thing about love, guys, is that I have to die. I have to, I have to lay down what's important to me so that I can be focused on someone else. And you think that when you're doing that, that you're never going to get those things again, that that's a death that you're never going to be able to recoup. But the reality is when you give love away without strings attached in full generosity, it reciprocates and your spouse seeks to return that love in equal measure, focusing on the things that you want and need. So instead of getting them for yourself, you're receiving them from your spouse. And it's a beautiful cycle that can just repeat and repeat and repeat as often as you remember to lay down your life for a sinner who is more important than you. So basic practical applications for you here, uh, and then we'll be done. Number one, we can only give love to one another that we have received. If you don't know or you have not experienced the love that God has for you in and through Jesus Christ, you are not going to be able to give this kind of love to your spouse.
I would love to talk with you about that love. I'm sure Ryan would love to talk with you about that love, but you cannot give what you have not received. But if you have received it, if you do understand the love of God in and through his son, Jesus, then that's the opportunity that we have to replicate it in our relationships with our spouse. Um, and in addition, another, another way of thinking about that one is that you can't love a sinner until you have been loved as a sinner. You know, if you find it hard to love people who have failed or that have disappointed you, then I'm guessing there's probably some things you need to work on remembering that you're a sinner too, but God has still loved you in and through uh, all of it. So that's number one. Number two, the best covering for the sins of your spouse, the failures of your spouse, the disappointments of your spouse, is your love, not your wrath. The best covering for the sins and failures and mistakes of your spouse is your love, your generous laying down of your life for the benefit of a sinner who is more important than you, rather than berating them for their poor performance. Love is not based on performance. It's based on promise. And the way you express that is by loving based on what the way God has loved you. And he saw your sin and gave you love instead of giving you his wrath. And then finally, number three, we can fight for oneness in our marriage, for unity in our marriage by clinging to promise instead of grading performance. We, for our own selves, we cling to the promise of God that says, whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. That God so loved the world that he gave us his son for that reason. We cling to that promise. And then we can understand that God is willing to forgive us in our poor performance. But if we grade our performance all the time, if we grade each other's performance all the time, we'll just nitpick each other to death and our marriages will fall apart and we'll certainly not show the world anything about what Christianity is truly like or about what love really is or means. So friends, that's, uh, that's my quick um, lesson on what love is. I hope that sparks some good conversations for you as a couple. And I hope that that gives you some encouragement and even some inspiration. The next time you encounter failure or disappointment with your spouse, I hope that you will seek to love him or her the way that Jesus first loved you. I hope you guys have a great rest of this session, a great rest of your week. And I'll look forward to seeing you if you ever come out to see us at the West Campus. Hope you guys enjoy your evening. Thanks.